Hello there. The EU Commission has today announced a new digital identity for its citizenry. As per usual, please like, subscribe and comment below. Yes, that's right. The EU Commission has announced today a proposed framework for what it calls a European digital identity. Something that will be available to all EU citizens and residents and businesses in the EU. But as it's only EU, then it's not European, is it? The Commission says... They will be able to access online services with their national digital identification, which will be recognised throughout Europe. There they go again with that word Europe. The UK is in the continent of Europe, but due to post-Brexit EU data protection laws, I very much doubt those digital IDs will be usable here, without them allowing UK access to all EU personal data. Shock horror. Anyway, the Commission goes on. Very large platforms will be required to accept the use of European digital identity wallets upon request of the user, for example to prove their age. Use of the European digital identity wallet will always be at the choice of the user. What alternative will they end up having in reality? And... Under the new regulation, member states will offer citizens and businesses digital wallets that will be able to link their national digital identities with proof of other personal attributes, e.g. driving licence, diplomas, bank account. And the idea is that the European digital identity wallets will be usable widely as a way either to identify users or to prove certain personal attributes for the purpose of access to public and private digital services across the Union. Identify users to who or which authority exactly? Or will that be an ever-widening pool of Eurocrats? And how long before that is the only method by which EU citizens can access public and private services, with it being logged against every transaction? The aim is that by 2030, 80% of EU citizens will be using these digital IDs, and doubtless opening up the criminal classes to a whole new fraud opportunity. Well, there's a surprise. It appears that the citizens of the Irish Republic are being shortchanged by Brussels. According to the Irish Independent, Ireland is not getting a proportionate share of the EU's massive borrowings for post-Covid recovery, the Dale has been told. And it goes on to say that most EU funds are shared out to the EU member states on a per capita basis. And according to the Irish gripe, Southern Ireland has 1.1% of the bloc's population, but is actually only seeing less than three quarters of a percent of the grants. That's a tad over two thirds of what they'd normally expect to see. But when asked about this, the Prime Minister of the Republic, Michael Martin, basically said it was down to the Irish economy doing so well and keeping the country's GDP buoyed up. Because of our strong economic performance relative to others plus our population, the size of the allocation was what it was. That is the key factor in terms of the amount we've got, he said. And he went on to say that, as the EU recovered from the pandemic, Ireland would benefit from exports of goods and services into the EU single market. So he's basing Ireland's recovery purely on trade, while others get more grants. The trouble is that a lot of those EU pandemic recovery funds are grants, and all based on the EU Commission borrowing three quarters of a trillion euros. And that £750 billion has to be repaid by all EU 27 member states paying into the coffers. 
Now I wonder if Ireland will get a rebate for being good little Europeans where Brexit is concerned and also for not being allocated as much as other states. I'll leave that little question to your imaginations. So who did Donald Trump say he'd pay £100,000 not to listen to? Well, according to reports, that's what Trump said he would pay not to have to listen to the former UK Prime Minister, Theresa May. Writing in The Spectator, Piers Morgan said, When I informed Donald Trump just before the last US election that Mrs May gets paid more than £100,000 a pop for speeches, he exploded into mocking laughter and spluttered, Are you kidding me? I'd pay £100,000 not to hear her talk. And Piers went on to say that the former US president was rather bemused that since leaving number 10, Mrs May had managed to rake in more than a million quid for giving corporate speeches. But now that Trump has said this, I expect Obama and Biden have asked May to go and speak to the Democrat conventions. I wonder if Theresa May precedes her speeches with shimmying onto the stage in kitten heels before sending the attendees to the land of Nod over their brandy and cigars. Or aren't cigars allowed anymore? And talking about nobodies, it seems that the BBC has come under fire for tonight's question time lineup of No One We've Ever Heard Of Befores. On publishing the list of five names, Tory MP Lucy Fraser, Labour MP Peter Kyle, Member of Independent Sage Anthony Costello, Journalist Jenny Murray and Business Expert Heather McGregor, the Question Time Twitter account had responses like The D Team and A Bunch of Nobodies. And it begs the question of how much longer can the BBC keep this limping show on the road? Now, I would hazard a guess that the Question Time team are always looking for big guns to go on their programme. After all, why wouldn't they want the top ministers and household names on it? So they would probably be contacting the right sort of people to keep the interest and hence the ratings up. But big names are not coming forward to go under the QT spotlight. And the BBC needs to ask why that is, get the answers and address them. After all, it's the decision makers that people want to see answering questions, not those that just tow party lines, say it's above their pay grade and that they can't speak for other people. Unless the BBC is purposely burying its own once flagship programme, of course. But most people who have watched BBC Question Time over the years know exactly why it's now failing. So tell the BBC why in the comments section below. Now I have talked about this before, but it deserves another airing. And that is the needling subject of second homes. And this is important as it is one of the drivers of nationalist separatism in the UK, especially in Wales. Now, you may believe that the Welsh will never, ever vote to leave the UK, but I think you could be wrong. Now, here's a story from the BBC, and I ask, if this was happening to your community, how would you feel? Residents of a small village fear their community will be lost forever, as most of the homes are being used for holiday lets. Only two out of the 50 properties in Cooma Egg Lewis, Pembrokeshire, have permanent residents. A third is for sale for more than £1 million and locals say they're being priced out of the market. They want to see urgent action to protect coastal communities from the rise in second home ownership. And it's this sort of thing that could cause a leap in the already accelerating Welsh separatist sentiment. And when an entire village is made up of second homes empty for most of the year, where are the jobs, schools and hospitals that would sustain a local community? As an example, despite it now being a holiday village, Coomereg Lewis does not even have a pub. 
the Welsh are now effectively ghettoised in the South Wales valleys and in large towns in North Wales. With coastal counties in areas such as Pembrokeshire and in green heartlands such as Powys all falling prey to those with more money than conscience from the southeast of England. Yes, where I come from. Of course, this isn't just taking place in Wales, but it is this ghettoising of the Welsh that may ultimately be one of the many reasons that Wales votes to leave the Union. The game is already over if we don't look at the driving factors in the growth of independence popularity. And this immoral practice of taking a home out of the reach of a local family in order for a wealthy person to own what they see as a gold mine second home is one of the top issues that is driving a desire for Welsh independence. And if that day did come, I wonder how much those second and holiday homes will be selling for as owners offload them before a compulsory purchase order is placed on them by the local authorities. So what do you think about the EU digital ID, Brussels shortchanging Ireland, Trump's opinion of Theresa May, BBC Question Time or Second Homes in Wales? Please like and comment below.